I guess I just sent out on Twitter here. I'm going to retweet it on the other account. And then as soon as we get some people showing up, I'll kind of introduce every, everybody here. We got, it looks like we got some people filing in, so that's good. And good, it's already got them uh, muted as well, so I'm not going to have that interference. So that's good. But uh, give us a couple minutes here, guys. We get everything set up here. Glad to have you as we're joining in. Uh, wherever you're at in the world, you know, drop us, uh, drop us a chat in the chat here. We'll have both, uh, actually not for this one. So no Q and A, but we'll have the chat. So as you're going, we've got some great questions lined up with some great coaches here who are going to, uh, you know, nice round table discussion, going through some great topics. And if you've got some specific questions that you've got, we're going to be talking about college recruiting, you know, the, the ins and outs, ins and outs of that, the, you know, one oh one. what do, what do parents need to know? What do the players need to know? navigating that right now especially during this pandemic you know there's a lot of changes going on on that side of things these coaches are going to be discussing that uh the challenges they're dealing with and what you know they they want the players to know and the parents to know to get the most out of this time and then also going to be talking about uh kind of the the big elephant in the baseball world right now which is the travel baseball and select baseball something that rob was reaching out to me to after the virtual baseball coaches summit was you know, stuff that he's been seeing out there of is, is it good for baseball? Is it bad for baseball? You know, there's a lot of, a lot of discussion around that. A lot of kids go into that and we want to make sure that, you know, we're not being just here to come wreck the travel ball party. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of benefits to it, but at the same time, you know, is it the best route? So um, Rob, thanks for getting everybody here today and I'll kind of let you uh, tee things off here for us. Yeah, absolutely. I'm Rob Henry, head baseball coach at Kentucky State University, Division II baseball program in Frankfort, Kentucky, uh, member of the Southern Intercollegiate Athletic Conference. And, um, you know, just you and I were talking a little bit earlier this summer. I had done a, um, a podcast or a Zoom call, I guess, with you earlier this summer. And we have gotten to talking about um, just the world of recruiting and travel ball and, and showcases and things like that. And you just see uh, with social media, a lot of good and a lot of bad stuff out there, and, and we decided we wanted to talk a little bit about maybe some things that can uh, help recruits, help parents, things we see from, from our side of things, because uh, as coaches, a lot of times maybe we don't get to talk as freely as we want to about what we see out there, so I thought tonight might be a good opportunity to do that. Absolutely. Well, let's just go, you know, a little round the horn here, quick introduction, and um... We'll we'll start over there with with you, Larry. I see you up up next on the on the corner there. Cool. Uh, thank you for having me tonight. Uh, pretty cool topics that I'm excited to hear what everybody has to say about. Um, Larry Owens, head baseball coach at Bellarmine University uh, in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, we recently uh, made the jump to NCAA Division One uh, as a member of the ASUN conference. Uh, so this will be the first year that we uh, compete in it. Um, I'm entering my uh, eighth year here, um, spent some time in college, spent some time uh, in professional baseball and now back in college. So, um, you know, been around it a while and, and have seen all this evolve. And so I'm interested to hear, you know, everyone's points of view. Yep, absolutely. Well, thanks for, thanks for coming on tonight, Larry, and I'm um, really looking forward to this one. Uh, Todd, why don't you introduce yourself over there and I can see the Wofford shirt on representing strong strong tonight just just got done with individuals so it's nice it's nice to be back on the field but um my name is Todd Interdonato I'm the head baseball coach at Wofford College uh, I was our assistant for two years I'm entering my 14th year as our head coach so obviously 16 overall uh, originally from Phoenix Arizona so grew up on the west coast and you know played all my high school and junior college baseball on the west coast and then made the move to the east coast um, like I said I've been at Wofford for the last 16 years Hey, that's awesome. We're really excited stuff there and glad to, glad to see that kind of track record over there at Wofford. No, no things are going well uh, for you guys and looking forward to getting, getting to have college baseball back this year. So uh, okay. Reggie, take, take the floor, sir. Welcome in. Year uh, coaching. Uh, this will be my fifth year uh, as head. Um, just excited to be here tonight, um, along with the rest of the guys, uh, just to talk some good baseball, give some good insight and uh, input from our point of view. Uh, thanks for having me again and glad to be here. 
Absolutely. Welcome in, Reggie. Real glad to have you. And and last but not least, Mr. Hemmings down there. How are you, sir? I'm doing good. Um, my name's Scott Hemmings. I'm the head baseball coach at Albany State University. I've uh, transitioned from a junior college. We were at Darden State College for a long time. And um, I've been a junior college coach for, I think, 13 or 14 years. I've been a Division II coach now. This is my fifth year. Um, I've also spent a, a, spent, a, spent a short time in high school baseball, so I kind of got a wide gamut of, of experience, and I'm entering my 19th year uh, into uh, college coaching, and I'm um, excited to be here. I'm also uh, entering into the rec league with my eight-year-old son and uh, travel ball, so I'm starting to get some experience in, in, in all levels, so um, hopefully I can bring something to the table tonight. Oh yeah, that's awesome. Well, really excited to to hear about that for your son. What what position is he is he going into right now? Well, he got well. I mean, he's eight, but he got stuck at first base because he was the only person to catch it. And and finally, I I had the guts as the head rec league coach to move him to shortstop. And he's a pretty good shortstop too. So <laughs> that's well, that's going to be exciting. Well, Scott, let's let's have have you tee it off there. What is going on, you know, for for you at, at your program on the recruiting side right now? What are, what are you guys able to do, and what are the kind of restrictions that are happening with with the COVID pandemic right now? Well, we just got clearance September first to get off campus, but um, our athletic director wants us to be pretty spotty with with what we're doing and making sure we get permission to go off and making sure it's a real need to go instead of just a a want to go to an event. Um, Right now, I don't really know what we need. We hadn't even been on the field yet, uh, so we're we're still trying to sift through um, some things uh, of, of what our what we have this year. Uh, we have a, a large roster, but simply because we returned 13 seniors from the coronavirus redshirt, I guess for better words, um, and so then we also got a graduate transfer and got a few more transfers in. So we've got 40 people on the roster. So um, until we get on the until we're able to get out on the field and kind of evaluate. Uh, that's going to kind of determine our needs. But being a Division II school, honestly, uh, we probably do the majority of our recruiting um, through the junior colleges late in, in, in April and May, um, try to pick up a few pieces of the puzzle in, in the high school realm, maybe in the fall through some showcases. But but the majority of our recruiting comes late um, just simply because, uh, you know, we, we need to make sure we make the right decisions with our scholarship situations. And we, we can't afford to miss on a player. Um, so we have to really watch him, follow his numbers. Uh, if we commit a guy too early in the fall and he doesn't pan out, that can, that can be detrimental to our, our program just because of our budget scenario. Well, just on, on, on that topic, Scott, real quick, is, is since you guys are big on the JUCO side of things, what's you know one or two big pieces? Obviously, you're looking for the talent and you're filling the holes uh, in your program, but what's one or two big pieces that – you're looking at when you're recruiting a junior college guy versus, you know, a high school player? Well, one of the things that have been successful for us, and, I, and when I speak, I speak a lot uh, to different groups and organizations. I'll go speak at a church. I'll, I'll speak wherever somebody, you know, gives me a platform. Um, but you have to have an outlier tool in our program. Um, and, and, for example, you have to do something pretty good or actually real good. I mean, it could be a velocity. It could be power. It could be speed. Uh, but but we, we've kind of you kind of get into a point to where just the you need the average guy that can do everything good, but we want guys that have an outlier tool. He might strike out a lot, but he on the right day he can hit the ball over the fence. Maybe a guy that that is not a great hitter, but he can run a six three or six four sixty. So when we recruit and we send our coaches out to recruit, we always talk about what can that guy do good. Because you only got to be good a couple times throughout the year. And so we want to make sure we get a good base of guys that can catch the ball and throw the ball and throw strikes. But at the end of the day, you better have some real guys in the middle of the lineup and you better have a real guy on Friday or Saturday or you're just going to have an okay season. And um, we've been – we've played in a conference title game six out of eight years, been to the, a national regional four times, been to a World Series – um, we had our first two guys off our 15, 16 team make their big league debut about three weeks ago. And, and throughout the last probably 12 years, 10 years that I've been at this, at this school, we've gone after outlier tools. Now we've built the base of some good players that can do some good things pretty good. But at the end of the day, your three, four, five hitter and your Friday, Saturday, Sunday starter better be better than other teams. You're not going to be very good. 
Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Reg, I'm going to flip that right back over to you. Same, same topic for you guys on the recruiting side of things. What's been, you know, wh what's the status at, at your program and what are the kind of challenges you guys are dealing with over there right now? Yeah, ab absolutely, Kyle. Um, at Tuskegee right now, we're at a standstill, a lot like Scott. Um, we're just getting, um, you know, permission to get out. Um, but administration um, at our school is – they're pretty, they're pretty um, safe driven right now. So they just kind of want us to spread things out and um, if, if possible, not go out to say the least. Uh, but um, we fight around that because it's, it's important uh, to see the kids for us. Um, so it, it's, as much as we can place our eyes on you and get familiar with you and um, you know, your family and your dynamic and of who you are, your skill sets, um, the better for us. Um, but uh, right now uh, we're just, we're really, um, we're, we're overpopulated as well, man. Uh, COVID has, has done a deal on us. Uh, so it's, a, it's an exciting thing. Um, it's going to be some, you know, um, very competitive moments if we get going here in the fall. Hopefully we can get going, um, you know. Uh, but we're excited about what we have returning. Um, so at, at the same time, COVID was pretty uh, tough on the guys. But uh, with us returning, our entire squad feeling good about the momentum of where we left off. We're just going to try to find it, find it again and um, add the new pieces. Um, so just to go into a little bit of recruiting dynamic for us, it's important for us academically. Um, so we have to really pay attention to the academic standing uh, due to the situation with scholarship. Uh, so we'll, we'll definitely pay attention to the academics, uh, the kids sharp, then we'll go into the skill sets as well, uh, just to look for uh, certain things that fit our program, our style. So we, we, we want to uh, definitely bring in those strengths of um, speed. Um, you know, we, we're, we're looking to be a, a speed program, a uh, program that can play a little bit of small ball, uh, just a little bit of versatility. Um, and how we address our, our, our program is up the middle, definitely, just like a lot of others. Uh, we have to be a little bit more crafty on the pitching end uh, just because we may not get the high velo guys. Uh, so what can this guy do different from the next? Um, that's, that's basically how we scatter our um, pitching recruiting um, just to see if we can find some, a kid that can uh, differ from the, from the next guy uh, just to give us a chance uh, in, in different situations and uh, with different hitters. Uh, but, uh, it's 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 gonna be a tough year for us uh, in the aspect of um, really recruiting JUCO. Uh, but when we recruit JUCO, uh, we like to get out around the same time as Scott. Um, you know that 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 we love to get out um, the the late fall. Um, definitely love to get out and even sometimes get JUCO programs into us. Um, you know for scrimmages. And that helps us uh, just to get preparation and just to see see the kids on the campus um, in the aspect of um, what they can bring to our program. Uh, but uh, really right now, pitching is a heavy need uh, for us. Um, you know, any, and any, any aspirations as far as going into uh, postseason play, we have to beef that, that pitching staff up. Do you get many uh, two-way two-way players on, on your end for the pitchers? Um, we're yes, yes and no. Uh, we've really gotten away from it. Um, you know, in the last two years, we just a good thing because um, you may we may have now rostered. We have about two or three guys that may go two-way, um, but that is a good deal. Uh, we we like to tell our kids that we recruit. Uh, if, the more you can do, uh, if you can add pitching to a dynamic, we could really use you, um, especially with our situation as far as scholarships. If we can expand one guy and get multi-use out of them, the better. Yeah, for sure. And then this isn't by any means, uh, you know, a pitch or a shout out for them. I, I worked a showcase down in Frisco for uh, show ball baseball camps, and they were the – Head, head coach academic camps is that something Absolutely. is that something you guys are are following their live streams and, and some of those yes yes really uh we're locked in definitely on the academic standard um those showcases and and we even put on our own academic showcases as well 
okay. just to sift through the kids out there, uh, just to see yeah. if we can get the the most talented out that pool. Now that's that's interesting. I I hadn't really looked into you know many other showcases before, uh, kind of helping out with some of this stuff. Besides, you know, when I was playing. And is that is that pretty common for individual colleges to host the academic type showcases, or are there more other uh, entities, organizations that'll host specific uh, types of academic showcases like that? Uh, most times, other entities definitely um, will will go out to those showcases, but we have put on um, our own academic showcase uh, just because we had a, a qualified pool of kids to reach out a lot of kids um, that may reach out via email. We'll, we'll pull those kids in. They're high academic kids because of the school, um, you know, what, what we have to offer academically. And so I, I like to look, I don't like to overlook any kid. Uh, so I'll pull those email kids in and, and kind of do an academic showcase. Okay, cool. Yeah, I like that. Uh, Todd, I'm going to flip it over to you here. What's going on over there at Warford for the recruiting side of things right now? So, you know, it was it was definitely something that we didn't anticipate. You know, when we first got into this whole thing, you know, we kind of thought it would slow down. And, you know, we were interested in continuing the recruiting process with, you know, the 21 grads that we had seen in the fall that, you know, that we had seen or even the 22 grads that, you know, that we had seen. And we thought it was just going to be a continuation and as we got into that in April and May, you know, and the NCAA just kept pushing back the date that you could go out, you know, it was like every month that we just had to readjust and, okay, what do we do now? And, and now what do we do? And just something simple like, you know, we were always looking at video. You know, we always looked at video. We always looked at it as a primary tool. But then a lot of things that we started doing were, okay, man, now we need raw footage. You know, that was, that was a term that happened in our program this year that wasn't really you know, part of our vernacular in the last few years, it was, okay, man, we want to see you pitch, but like, we need raw footage. Like we need from the time the inning starts until the time the inning ends, no edits. And we were doing like that. And so that was just something that we adjusted and we ended up just filling up our, our 21 class and getting a good start on the 22 class, you know, kind of through that. But I found myself going back to you know, kind of, and, you know, when it was coming down to, you know, hey, man, we want to offer this guy first or this guy first, you know, you felt like the tiebreaker always went to the guy you knew better. And, you know, so for us, it, it was it was that I was just having a conversation with, you know, one of my best friends who's a who runs a travel ball program in North Carolina. And he goes, what do you think the chances are of you guys getting out? I said, man, I think it's zero. I, I, I do. I think it's zero. I just don't think we're going to be able to get out to the spring. You know, you know, you've heard two head coaches talk about how careful their administrators are being. Our, ours are the same. You know, I just don't see how, you know, we're taking all these precautions and, you know, for trying to protect college basketball, rightfully so. And, you know, all of a sudden we're going to open this thing up and, and go from a dead period to a contact eval period. I just, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't stir the Kool-Aid for me. So, you know, I think we're going to have to continue with the, with the video. I think we're going to have to continue to move forward with that. And, you know, I, I do need to say this. This was really interesting. This was my most interesting year recruiting for me, not because of the pandemic, but my nephew is a, is a 21 right-handed pitcher out of Phoenix and pretty talented kid, ended up with five or six Division One offers. And I got to go through the process with them from the other side. And so, you know, for me, I just couldn't believe the challenge it was for them to go get a good look. I mean, he, he made five visits and didn't talk to a coach. And, you know, th this is just a very interesting time. And I just kept telling them, and this is, I guess, some unsolicited advice. It's no different from before. You just make the best decision you can make based on the information you got. And now the information is just a little bit different than it was before. So you just got to make the best decision you can make with the information you got from the coaching side and from the player and family side. Yeah, I got, I got two quick questions for you on that one, Coach. One on the, on the raw footage piece. Is that more along the lines to see, like, body language and how a player is reacting in between pitches or what's the uh, idea behind the raw footage? Well, it's all of it. You know, it's, it's, you know, you know, we're running, you know, we're joking around. We're like, yeah, this guy threw 18 pitches and he th was 18 for 18 with strikes. Like that's not realistic. Like, you know, was he 18 for 64 or was he 18 for 25? Like which, which one was it? Um, you know, so definitely to get a better, a better idea, but yeah, the body language for sure. Um, you know, we were recruiting a catcher and I said, Hey man, I want to see raw footage. 
And, you know, I wanted to see where his eyes were. I wanted to see, you know, how much he was intaking. I wanted to see how he commanded the game, you know, on a first and third. I wanted to see him come out and give a sign in a, in a first and third situation, just little things like that. So, you know, the answer is all of it. You know, you want all of it. You want, you know, you want the bad, you want the good, you want the body language, you want, you know, you want all of it. So, you know, that was our idea behind it was just gathering as much information as we could. Yeah, yeah, that's huge. Uh, it's good, good points to bring up. It's not, not something you really think about until you're, since, you know, since you can't be there to see that kind of stuff. Um, and then on the flip side, you were talking, you know, this was the most interesting year for you, despite the pandemic on the recruiting side, you know, just for, you know, anybody listening, say they don't have, you know, the, the coaching experience and they're not necessarily going through that recruiting process yet. Uh, but maybe they're getting ready to whatever stage that they're at, you know, just kind of break that down what it was like for you on, on the other side, helping out uh, your, your family there. What maybe it's kind of like brief steps of, of what you were seeing that was different. What I found really interesting was, you know, my brother's a pretty successful businessman and his wife is very successful in her career. And what I found interesting was, was, you know, just because they turned to sports, I felt like they kind of turned off their common sense. You know, and it, this is their oldest child. And I told him, I go, Bob, man, you are a, you're as savvy of a businessman as you, as I've seen and use your common sense, man, use your judgment. You know, where's your BS meter? You know, all of the things when, when you're striking deals, you know, use all of those same skills. And I thought that was, you know, that's my advice to, you know, you, you know, you hear it all the time as coaches, at least I do. Well, coach, we're new at this. And, you know, this is our first time. And, and in the back of my head, I'm going, this isn't your first human interaction. This isn't the first time of you trying to strike a deal. This isn't the first time of you trying to read the guy on the other side of the desk to figure out if he's full of it or not. And, and so for me, my advice to, to families was trust your gut, trust your instinct. Just because you haven't done the athletic piece of this before doesn't mean you haven't done this before. It's just you're just applying it to a different skill set. And so to me, that was one thing I was constantly reminding my brother was, hey, man, you're a really good businessman use those skills, whether you're an engineer, postman, doctor, lawyer, you know, administrative assistant, it doesn't matter. Like use those skills that you've had in the real world to, to help navigate. And then those, the, you said he wasn't able to sit down with, with the coaches was, was he going straight to the school for uh, an official visit and wasn't meeting with the coach or was this at a, at a camp or clinic kind of thing that he didn't get to meet with them? What was the scenario there? So he just, they just went, they just went on campus and they just toured campus on their own. They grabbed a campus map and they went around and, you know, they went around in the area and, and they just did it on their own. And, and some, you know, some coaches FaceTimed with them. Sometimes some coaches texted with them, you know, some coaches didn't do anything. And so it was just really interesting, um, you know, just watching him go through it. But, but he goes, you know, my brother's like, should we visit? I go, hell yeah, you should visit. And he's like, but we can't meet the coach. I go, but you can still walk on the campus. Like you can still see the city. Like, you know, I, th I go, don't use the fact that you can't meet the coaches an excuse to not go get a vibe for the campus, especially because he was just doing this, you know, last week, two weeks ago. And, okay. and you know, the students were there. Like you can't, you yeah. know, nobody can stop you from walking up and talking to a student. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a big impact for sure. Well, Larry, I'm a, I'm a flip it over to you there. What's uh, what's going on with you guys right now on the recruiting side of things and what's some of your challenges that you guys are trying to overcome? But we're, we're, we face the same challenges that everyone else has, obviously, that there's, um, there's not a lot of room anywhere right now. And it's going to get better each, each class. But, uh, you know, we're recruiting the same way everybody else is. We've had to result to, you know, dealing with uh, lots of video, you know, like Todd has, has spoke of. Um, us, we kind of take the high school route. We don't really take the junior college route a lot. We have in the past. But we haven't a ton. Just every now and then, you get a need, you get the right transfer, you get the right junior college transfer, and that and that uh, certainly has helped us. Um, you know, Todd covered a lot. Todd kind of, I think, you know, hit it pretty good in regards to, um, you know, how we're handling this. The the tough part is not being able to see anybody in person, whether you rely on raw footage or not. Um, you know, to me, it's more about the gra grading their tools, grading what they can do, I think is, it's not easy, but it's the easier part. I'm more concerned about, I'm really, really concerned about what kind of people we're bringing to campus. I'm, I really, the hardest, the hardest tool to grade is their makeup and what they're made of. Nobody is ever going to sit across from you and say, he's, he's, he's not going to miss a class. He's going to be a, 
social angel. He's going to do this. He's going to hit 350. He's going to win 15 games. He's going to, I mean, nobody tells you that he's going to miss every class, that he's going to, you know, be a social misfit. They don't say those things. What are they going to be like when they get to campus? And I think that's one of the, the hardest things for us to find out. And they've even made it, it this situation has become even more difficult because of that. How we're, how we're able to recruit. We've relied on a lot of Zoom meetings. We've talked to a lot of recruits via Zoom and then they go on campus and they got to go on campus by themselves. You know, as a, uh, since, you know, we, we're dead as well. We can't get off campus. You know, some, some universities, some divisions can, some can't. We're still stuck where we have to, we're dead. We can't get off campus, so we have to rely on the video. Um, I don't know, it's, it's just a very, very odd situation and it's, it's compounded by space because now you're the class that, the classes that you're recruiting aren't replacing the classes that you thought were going to be gone or be gone as soon as they were going to be gone. You know, we had six of our seven seniors come back. So, you know, that's created some challenges. Now we have a roster of 40. So that's a little large for us. Um, it's going to get better for us each year, but there are other schools that have a heck of a lot more than 40 guys on their roster right now. You know, the, the transfer portal's full close to 1,500 on the Division One side, close to 500 D2. And then this year, D1's up to 60 and D2's up to 56. Granted, New York Tech just dropped their program, so that's why the Division Two, you know, has a lot of kids in the portal. But, you know, it's just – everything's so weird. It's, and, and I feel so bad for the 21 class because there aren't many roster spots for them to, um, you know, for them to take advantage of. There's just, there's a lot – there's not space. And, and I think for once, finally, though, I mean, I think we're in the driver's seat, though. We have the upper hand now. We can be a little more selective in who we bring to campus and, and who we decide to make offers to. Um, so, you know, if, if there's any silver lining, I mean, at least, you know, now we do have a bit of an upper hand where we haven't always had it. Some of us haven't had it very much at all. Um, but, I don't know, I, I guess the only thing I could – I could say, and I hope a lot of this conversation goes tonight, is I feel for that class, that 21 class is, I think, the most affected by this, and they're the ones that are scrambling around figuring out how they're going to find a home. And then we're trying to, you know, am I going to take this kid without even maybe getting to know him or, or, or see him play? I can't even see him play in person. This is – that's one thing. That was a big no-no for me. I mean, I, I kind of looked at myself as the, our recruiting coordinator does the recruiting, but I'm the cross-checker and the closer. I'm going to close the deal if I need to, and I'm going to own a cross check to make sure that we're, that we're all seeing the same things. Um, and so now we're cross checking video or we're cross checking, you know, game footage if we can see it. Um, and so it's a, it's a pretty weird dynamic, but you know, I don't know if that's a, a ton to add to what has already been talked about, but I mean, it's, it's a strange, strange time. That's for sure. I mean, it's, it's important stuff, you know, and on, on the makeup tool that you brought up is, is there any way that you feel like you can get a sense of that through social media for these, for these players out there right now or, or any other ways? I mean, I know you mentioned doing the zoom meeting with them. That's only going to, you know, be able to tell you so much and just any, any ways you're able to try to analyze that, especially being more selective I now. By, I think by speaking to them, you can kind of, you know, you like, you know, like Todd talked about his, his brother's a savvy businessman. I mean, we, you do it enough, you get a good feel for people. You talk to a lot of people. It's what, what's all, all we do is communicate. As coaches, we communicate and talk to people. So hopefully you get a good feel for, you know, what you, what you potentially might be getting. But then, you know, I want to call as many people, hopefully. And over time, I think it's easier the longer you've done it. That, that probably it's likely that you know a few more people that you can speak with and find out about, you know, the kid you're, you're potentially bringing to campus. And you want to find out, you know, what he's like. Um, you know, and like, I, I always liked, it's a small example, but I mean, I, I want to know, what are you doing when nobody's looking? What are you doing when, what kind of person are you when nobody's looking? When nobody, when you don't know anybody's there, how are you going to play the game? In the minor leagues we talked about, we would do a, a, a non-thrown PFP. And I remember one day stopping it, you know, it doesn't have to be just hustle 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 everywhere we're you know these were professionals at the time but if you're going to do it do it right what if there were 30 big league managers sitting in the dugout would you do it any differently now or if they weren't there how would you do it any differently and I'm not going to you want the guy that is going to play the same way all the time and and you know 
game looks give you an opportunity to do that, but also just, you know, doing your homework and trying to find out as much as you can about this guy. Um, you know, like, like Reggie at, at Tuskegee, we, we seek high achieving students too. So typically we seek the high achieving students. Typically I get a pretty good kid, um, but that's not guaranteed. So I have to do my homework and make sure that, you know, we get the, the right kind of person um, here. And uh, that's what I think we've done a pretty good job of. And uh, I don't know, you know, that, that's just the way we, we kind of handle it. It's my view on it anyway. Yeah. I've got Troy asking here. He said there's four semesters before the 2021s get a shot to be on the field. Do you expect more roster spots to open up uh, over that time? I think they could. I mean, it, it would it would depend. I mean, like at Bellarmine, I haven't had a kid in the transfer portal in two years. So I don't I don't know. I mean, other schools, you know, there may be some movement. There may be some movement at the break. I mean, to create space, you know, that's hard to say. Um, I think it's going to be case by case, school by school. Um, I would, you know, I don't know. It, it's, it's full, man. I don't know. It's really crazy. I mean, a lot, of, I would say most schools or colleges right now have, I would say anywhere between, I think it's safe to say 40 to 70 people on campus, 40 to 60. I don't know. I, I don't know how many everybody here has. I, I just, I'm just kind of guessing. I, I think everybody probably gave their seniors a chance to come back if they can make it work. And um, then everybody else gets an extra year. So, and then, and you'll see, it'll get better each year because there are, are certain, you know, the juniors that your, your current junior class, your COVID junior class may not take advantage of their fifth year. Some of them may go on and I'm not going to play pro ball. I have my degree. I'd rather go make, you know, $85,000 a year than come back here and pay for school and be more in debt. Um, so I think it's, I think it's, you know, that's a, that's a tough question, Troy, because it's so, it's just so dependent on, on the institution, but the rosters are, are full. And, and looking at that rot, looking at the transfer portal, you're like, my God, where, where are you guys going to go? I mean, it's, I don't know, maybe these guys have, you know, more info or could elaborate a little more on it, but that's, I don't know. It's a tough one. It's tough for sure. Is there any expansion on, on the red shirts uh, since, since this happened, or are they just doing it for, for the seniors and, everybody from last year that came in to kind of give these guys that are there now to, you know, open that up a little bit. At our level, at least the guys that, that played got their year back if they choose to take it, whether you could have been a red shirt. So you could theoretically have three classes of freshmen on your campus this year. You could have the last, the red, last year's red shirt freshman, last year's freshman and this year's true freshman. So it's, it's nuts. It is. It is. Well, Rob, I'm going to uh, let you in, in the bottom of the second inning here for us and, and share your, your, shot, your side of the story over there. Okay. And uh, kind of piggy, piggyback off what Larry said, my center fielder next year is going to be 26 years old. So, <laughs> so I got that going for me. <laughs> um, but, but I'm in the same boat. I'm at 38 players. And, you know, what I've had to tell some 2021s and kind of to address the, the question that was brought up, um, you know, I've, I've told some 2021 recruits, I could go this entire year, skip this recruiting class, redshirt all my 2020 kids, and be done with recruiting for a year, if, if I wanted to. Now, obviously, that's not the direction I want to go, but that's the reality we're all facing right now. So it, it's, it's become really incumbent. I think, you know, Larry and, and Todd and everybody else have kind of mentioned the, the character component. You know, um, performance is based on talent. It's based on behavior. And you've got kind of this, this balancing act, this sliding scale. The more talented a kid is, maybe he doesn't have to behave as well. Um, the gift that we have now with the roster sizes is we can be a little bit more discerning about what we do with, with recruiting players into our programs. We can, we can afford to be patient. Um, and it's frustrating because it, it's hard for uh, the kids in this, the 2021 class and the 2022 class, um, you know, to see how this has changed. But what, it, what it's meant for me, and I, I guess, kind of to turn this conversation around a little more away from us and more about, uh, you know, kind of recruiting in general, uh, it is with me. I started as a head coach eight, almost nine years ago now. And my first, uh, my first goal as a, um, as a head coach is I need to upgrade our talent. And I did so, but I did so without maybe taking um, character into account as much as I should have. And I, I recruited a lot of kids out of the – the showcases and, and what they showed 
uh, talent wise versus maybe what they showed character wise. And what I've learned over the last four or five years is um, you win more with the right kind of people than you do with talent. So, you know, kind of going back to what we had, had started off with as far as the, the entire premise of the conversation is I've, I've gone a little bit more away from the showcases and more towards the games. And what that's meant is that's been hard for me not being able to get out uh, and see these kids in games. It, it's like Todd said, you know, kids 18 for 18 throwing strikes. But, you know, was that, was that in, you know, 18 pitches or 18 strikes in 25 or 18 and 64? Um, I need to see those things in person. Um, so when I, I look at social media and I look at the stuff that's out there on Twitter and Instagram about these kids and uh, this 2024 is uncommitted, better snap them up kind of thing, um, you know, I, I just kind of have to laugh a little bit. You know, I need, I need to go see those guys in person. I, I'm not going to recruit a kid out of a showcase anymore. I'm going to see what kind of character they have, what kind of quality they have. How do they talk to their mom when we're in a recruiting visit in, in my office? You know, how do they treat their their little brother, their little sister, you know, and just things like that. How do their coaches talk about them? Um, you know, how do they interact with me? So, um, you know, to kind of turn it into, you know, the direction of the, the, the topic of just recruiting in general and showcases and travel ball and things like that. Um, I know in, in my, you know, going on nine years as a head coach and 25 overall, it, it's amazing to me how early the recruiting game is is starting for a lot of these. I remember when I first started at Kentucky Wesleyan back in the late 90s, we were ecstatic. We got our first kid to commit the fall of his senior year. You know, now think about it now. If a kid waits until fall of his senior year, he feels like he's behind the game. And you just kind of wonder, you know, what are, what are we really doing here? You know, having these kids committing earlier and pressuring them and all that. So, um, I, I'll just kind of, you know, lead that into everybody else and, and you take and run with it wherever you want, with whoever you want. But um, you know, I'd like to see what some guys think about, you know, just the state of recruiting in general, maybe not for our program specifically, but, you know, generally speaking, what are we, what are we looking at here and what are we doing and, uh, you know, on our end of things to, you know, maybe stem the tide and maybe turn this around to where it's more beneficial to the students in, in their best interest. Yeah, whoever wants to, guys, you uh, go right ahead. Well, I think it's you know as as we go through it, um, you know, let me let me say this first. Um, I want to touch on a point you know that Larry made about. I want to I want to emphasize that it is a case by case basis. Um, you know, we're very unique in the fact that we do not have graduate school. So when, you know, when we got shut down, you know, we had, we had 10 seniors that were six weeks away from graduating. There was no way we were going to tell those guys to drop out of school and come back. So, you know, our 21 class, just to speak, just to speak to that, we found that, you know, we were kind of in a unique situation that we were just kind of moving on normally in recruiting. And so we felt like we got a hit in our 21 class because, you know, once we got past, you know, where we normally are, you're like, okay, like, you know, this is, you know, this is where we're at. I do think to, to touch on a point that Larry said, I do think if you ask me to, to place a bet, I'm going to have a hard time thinking that they're going to, that the power five schools are going to, are going to allow the NCAA to push us back to a 35 man roster limit in one year. I just, I, I just think that that's going to kind of gradually go down. So I agree with Larry's point. It's case by case. It's going to get a little better every year, but I just don't see them going, okay, free for all, free reign, have 65, boom, next year you're, you're back to 35. I just think it's going to kind of be a slow drip back in. Um, as far as the recruiting goes, you know, Rob, to, to kind of touch on your question, I just think that, you know, I keep waiting for the 24s to commit that don't work out. I, I keep waiting on the, you know, the 15 walk-ons that go to fill in the blank school that all end up transferring out after three semesters. I keep like waiting on that to kind of sink in and then for the, you know, for kind of the society to, to adjust back. And it just hasn't, you know, it, it just hasn't. And what I'm, what I'm afraid of is that they're going to give the one-time transfer exception back to baseball. And that's going to be the answer. The answer is no longer going to be, hey, man, wait a little bit longer, wait to commit. You know, the, you know, these guys got 55 guys on the roster, so on and so forth. And I think the NCAA is just going to give them an out. And as far as talking to parents and players, 
you know, I think retention rate has to be a, a really popular question in the recruiting process. Hey, what is your retention rate? You know, Larry makes a great point. He hasn't gotten the portal in two years. That, that's something that parents need to ask. You know, hey, what, you know, what percentage of your walk-ons make the team? Well, then, there, you know, then here comes a story about, you know, the one in 10 guy that made it that ended up getting drafted. But what's your retention rate? What's your APR? How many of these guys are you bring back? Where are you at with your senior class? Those penetrating questions just have to be asked because to me, as you move forward, it's not going to get better. You know, it, it's not going to be, you know, recruiting isn't going to get later. And so I think the only thing families can do is become a little more brash and a little more gutsy in the questions that they ask with, with coaches when they sit in their office. Because to me, if you are running the right program, you are not afraid to answer any question about what's going on. Here you go, brother. Here's the curtain. I'm pulling it back. You like what you see? Come on. You don't like what you see? We'll find somebody else. And so for us, I think the people that are the most transparent in answering those pointed questions, I think you're going to get a lot of good information to make the right decision. Yeah, that's big. Um, I'll bring something up just kind of on the player perspective when, when I was going through. So I, I did, I had a, my mom worked at a NAI school, so I was on uh, the tuition exchange program. So I didn't have to get, a, uh, you know, the athletic scholarship to get on. And I ended up going D3. They couldn't give out athletic scholarships out of the gate and, you know, went to a, a camp that they had out at the school that I went to uh, and, you know, got to talk to the coach. And there was, you know, it, it's not like they had a big senior class or anything, but just from talking to them and, and things like that, I thought, you know, okay, I'm, I'm definitely gonna have to put some work in, but I thought I was going to be able to, to make, you know, the varsity, they had a JV development program and, you know, freshman year in there, I'm going in and one of the top pitchers on the, on the JV side. And I'm just, I wasn't seeing any varsity time, but there were these other guys that got recruited through there that were getting those kind of looks. And, you know, same thing happened sophomore year going out dominating on, on uh, JV until one game we were playing a, a junior college one game and, uh, one of their players was making fun of a couple of our guys that actually threw like sidearm kind of Randy Johnson style, even though they weren't throwing that hard. I was like, all right, you know, I'm tired of these guys messing with this. I'm going to go out and, and kind of make fun of them in that sense. So I go out, throw three quarter sidearm and I end up jumping like two, three miles an hour and uh, getting some more movement on my pitches. And just like that, in, in one relief appearance, I get, I end up getting like uh, three straight appearances on varsity from there and it's just for me I was kind of frustrated I was like why why did it take so long for this to happen obviously you see a little bit of you know increase in performance but at the same time I'm hearing all these positive things from my coach and you know coming in saying oh you know we like you we like what you can do and and this and that but I just felt like I wasn't getting uh the the looks that I should have been getting and this isn't you know a woke kind of me story but I feel like there's there's a lot of a lot of times out there where coaches are, are telling the players maybe something that they want to hear that, you know, they're not, like you said, revealing the curtain to them and, and tell them the whole story or just shooting them straight with them. So I feel like, you know, the, the more that parents and, and players can be upfront about that kind of stuff and, and dig that out of their, the coach that they're trying to get into that school, you know, the better. Cause there was, there was definitely more uh, guys that were getting that looks and getting those recruits, even though it was, you know, a D3 and they couldn't give out the scholarships, but, I mean, that's just my kind of story and how uh, some I feel like a lot of players might be dealing with and how they can, you know, relate that to the, what they're going on coming up here. You know, I'll, I'll jump in on that too a little bit, you know, kind of what Todd was talking about, you know, with pulling the curtain back and parents and recruits maybe needing to be a little bit more brash. Um, you know, to me, and I think the biggest thing that, that works against recruits and parents a lot of times is, is fear, you know, maybe fear of the unknown, fear of uh, losing out on an opportunity. And I think too many times kids don't realize and, and parents certainly don't realize uh, a lot of times they have uh, a little more power than they realize. And it's just like I had a young man last summer I was recruiting, uh, said he got 11 calls in one week from a Division two assistant coach. You ready to commit? You ready to commit? need an answer, we're going to move on, you know, deadlining him and this and that. And, um, you know, finally, at the end of the week, the kid said, I'm, look, I'm just not ready yet. I'm still talking to schools and this and that. And the coach was throwing weirds. You need to man up. You know, you need to be a man. You need to make a decision. If you can't make a decision, we're going to move on. And he said, okay. <laughs> and 
Um, but there's a lot of people, I think, who get backed into a corner or feel like they have to dance with the first girl who asks them or whatever. And um, to me, I just, I, I see a lot more of that. And, and I wish parents and recruits realized, um, you know, in the recruiting process, this is, uh, you know, this is about their, one of the most important decisions they'll ever make. And they need to be real informed. They need to take all their looks, talk to all the coaches they need to and, and ask those penetrating questions like Todd is talking about. They need to ask, what is your graduation rate? What is your retention rate? What is your coaching philosophy? Um, you know, how, you know, and, and, you know, reach out to some of the players in the program and, and find out from them and, and really make an informed decision. I just, look, I got a 14 year old son and I love him to death. He's a smart kid, you know, really bright. He's not ready to make a decision on where he's going to college. And I'm seeing some of these kids and these parents either get bullied into it or they're afraid they're going to lose the, the brass ring. They're, they're afraid if they don't grab it now, they're going to lose it forever. Um, and to me, one of my biggest pieces of advice for any recruits or parents on here is realize, you know, you've got the right to get as much information as you need from as many different sources as possible. Uh, and I don't think there's enough uh, who realize that. I think there's too many who are wrapped up in the, in the recruiting process and, and being chased and then, you know, maybe jumping at the first best offer uh, versus, you know, waiting and being patient and looking at all their offers and looking at all their opportunities. To me, that's one of the biggest things I've seen when it comes to recruiting and how it's changed. Well, I'll just say one quick thing, you know, before um, Reggie or Larry or anybody else wants to hop in. I was wor working a showcase back uh, about three weeks ago, and I was running the Rap Soto for them. They were live streaming it, and they, um, they had, you know, Saturday combine day and then Sunday game day. And one of the teams, you know, they had a couple of players that didn't show up for their team. Well, this guy was listed as a PO and was going to come in and throw his, you know, three innings, whatever, uh, in kind of middle of the inning or middle of the game. And he ended up having, you know, this was in, in Texas. So it's, it was on a Sunday, it was hot. It was like 105 out, you know, everybody was just dying out there. You know, it was like three o'clock in the afternoon. And this kid has to go out and play in the outfield because they didn't have enough players. So, he, he went out first inning, you know, throwing all right, throwing good, probably like 12 pitches into his inning. And he just – we had to take, you know, 10, 20 seconds, catch his breath for a minute. He's, he hadn't been used to that kind of heat. Well, into that inning, his mom goes down to check on him. And this coach who's filling in, who's one of the guys, that, you know, in their recruiting is helping out uh, being one of the field coaches, is getting an earful from her. You know, why is he going out and playing the field? Why is he doing this? Why why you let him go out there? He's He came out here to pitch, and now all of a sudden he's he's tired. He's not going to pitch very well, da-da-da. And the kid ended up throwing four innings, and his third and his fourth inning, I mean, he, he ended up jumping below like two or three miles an hour the farther he kept going. So the kid was throwing good. But all these coaches just – checked him off right right away because they didn't want to deal with this mom that was that was causing a scene over there so I feel like you know on the flip side we, you guys talking about the makeup of the of, of the players there's a flip side where the parents you know and I'll let you guys talk about this of how, of how you're evaluating the parents and how many times have have you passed on a kid because of something the parents were doing you, you know you didn't like what you were seeing there Yeah, I would love to uh, say a little bit, Cal. Um, definitely a man. Um, had a had a situation maybe three years ago, and I uh, saw a red flag uh, with the family instance. Um, but like the kid, um, thought the kid was extremely talented and smart uh, in the classroom, high character, and I ignored the red flags. And uh, so got the kid in. <laughs> And turned out he was a lot like the parents. Uh, so that bit me, uh, but that was truly a learning lesson. Um, you know, so uh, to the parents out there, just be aware. Um, like Cal said, uh, most of those coaches, <laughs> it was an easy check off for them once they saw that red flag. So how, how parents represent uh, their children uh, definitely matters. Uh, it definitely matters because um, after that first learning lesson and it burned me and the program and affected us in some negative ways, um, you know, we're definitely, uh, I, I hate to say it this way, guys, but um, slightly recruiting parents <laughs> as well. 
Uh, so, you know, um, that's that's big advice out there, uh, Kyle, what you said. Um, just really make sure you represent your kid uh, well, just as you expect him to represent, he or she to represent, you know, you as a parent well. Well, if, if you guys don't have anything uh, else on that subject, I know, Rob, you wanted to talk about kind of the, the showcase circuit and, and some of that piece, you know, uh, let's kind of dive into that side of things. Where, where is it, where do you, I guess, draw the line on, you know, when does a kid need to get to going into showcases and when is he wasting his money going to them? To me, you know, my, my advice when it comes to that, when I, when I talk to, to parents or players is don't pay me not to recruit you. You know, if you're not ready to be showcased yet, don't waste the money. Spend the money on your development. You know, whether it's uh, private instruction, whether it's a gym membership, you know, whatever it is at, at 13, 14, 15 years old, I don't need to see a five, six, 130 pound second baseman. I need to see, uh, I need to see it develop and, and be bigger, stronger in a couple of years. Um, you know, so to me, that's, that's been one of the biggest changes a lot of times, and this has probably been that way since day one, but I didn't recognize it as a young coach, but a lot of times he's become a money grab and it becomes more about filling it out with numbers and you see these invite only or, or elite showcases and things like that. And it, it's opened up to everybody who wants to pay. Um, you know, so to me, that's the big one. It is, uh, parents, coaches, seek out somebody you trust to get advice uh, on whether or not you need to be attending these showcases and if you're ready to. And if not, um, don't do it because otherwise you're just paying me not to recruit you. And that's, you know, that's not what you want to do. And, and you need to be more worried about, you know, your exposure to your coach. If you're good enough, your coach is going to help push you along or somebody will help push you along, generally speaking. Um, you know, but too many times I hear people say, well, my coach didn't do this, my coach didn't do that. And, and my question back would generally be, are you ready to be exposed? Are you ready to be out there? Or, or are you just, you know, you're, you're another kid in this machine who's getting one of these mass emails that, that these schools, and, and we're guilty of it too. I got to pay my volunteers somehow. Um, you know, we're, we send out the camp emails too. Um, you know, are, are you a kid who's getting a generic camp email and thinks you're being recruited? Or are you a kid who, who's really, you know, ready to be recruited and ready to be out there and exposed? So, I mean, that's the big thing is I've seen a lot more slick marketing. I've seen a lot more um, you know, with, with the recruiting services and the things like that, uh, it's really getting into the parents' pockets and, and becoming a waste of, of a lot of these kids' time. And I'd like to hear what anybody else, you know, any other coaches, you know, from their perspective, they've seen over the course of their time uh, coaching, same, you know, same regard. Maybe any of you guys, Larry, I, I see you're getting ready to go next year. Just what are some of, the, you know, whatever you, your thoughts are on that, but also like to hear kind of what are your minimum you know, qualifications uh, for, for seeing a guy out at a showcase. I mean, you got going to after more high school guys, so. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, when you're recruiting or when I'm recruiting or when we're, when I, I can speak for us personally, I mean, I want to project. What are they going to, I want to know what they're going to, I want to have an idea what they're going to be like. What are they going to be like when they're 19, 21 years old? What are they going to be like? You know, and, and so a lot of projection goes into it. Um, I utilize the, recruiting services or video I just I kind of find myself I just if someone calls me about a guy or if there's something I want to know I, I just use the video just as a pointer just I just want to put eyes on him just to see what he does a lot of that doesn't all the other stuff that that's that that I'm looking at I, I really it's not important to me I, I just want to do it I can usually eliminate it's used more for me if as an elimination process it's a guy that I'm, I just don't have any interest in and let's move on or, yeah, this is interesting because I'm comparing to what uh, another player that I, that I had or, or saw uh, in person and on video, and I'm, I'm kind of using it as just a, a way to compare people or evaluate or uh, eliminate people, so to speak. So um, it's changed, man. This is my 30th year doing this, and uh, I remember when you couldn't call a recruit till July 1st uh, before his senior year of high school. Um, I remember when there was no such real thing as travel baseball. I didn't have it when I played. Um, and I've seen the evolution of it over the past 20 or so years. And then with the travel baseball comes the showcases. And as long as the parents drive the bus, as long as the parents are willing to pay for all this stuff, it's going to be there. 
Um, there are a lot of things that we could do to improve it. Um, but, and, and there are a lot of good travel organizations, just like there are a lot of good showcases, quality, quality showcases that have the best of intentions and, and, and do a good job. And then there are some that aren't that good. And, you know, that's, you know, I think, I think if a parent could just do their homework and try to find that one showcase or two or, or that showcase company or, 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 or depending on the level you are of, of, of talent you are. If you're a freshman and you're committed to a power five, you're not going to need a damn showcase. You're going to be all right. You know, if you're a, a junior or senior in high school or you're creeping up on your senior year and you haven't made a selection, I mean, you haven't made a choice of where to go to school, you need to, you need to narrow it down to here are some schools I like and do they have any on-campus prospect showcases that I can go be on their campus and in front of their coaches. And you, you, can, you can bet your butt that a lot of these small schools, I know we do it, I mean, we, we sign – we signed on um, one year, my third year at Bellarmine, fourth year at Bellarmine. I think we had 14 kids on our roster that came to one of our prospect camps. I mean, so we take those very seriously and, and they're very, they can be very beneficial. Um, and yes, we do use them to, su to support and help our volunteer assistants. And heck yeah, of course, but we also take it seriously and, and we tweak ours a little bit. It's not just strictly showcase. We like to do a little teaching and give the kids something uh, for it, but you know, and parents got to do their homework, but, but as, as long as they're willing to pay for these things, they're going to be around. And, um, you know, I, I don't rely on showcases or, um, recruiting services a great deal. Um, you know, sh showcase is great to see a lot of people in one place and you might grab a name or two and then you'll follow him the rest of the summer. You'll follow him the rest, you know, you'll look into him more. You'll, you'll dive in and see what kind of person he is. And then, Go see what kind of player he is if you get a chance to go watch him play. So there's some benefit to it, but – and they're everywhere, that's for sure. And then there's other contributing factors. Then what about the kids that pitch on travel ball teams that have rosters of 11 kids and they can't cover the innings that they're required to cover for the weekend, and then they go to showcase on Tuesday and they blow up because they're trying to throw for a radar gun. They get 10 pitches, and they're, so they're going to air it out. And, I mean, there, there's, there's a lot of, you know – not so good things going on with this as well. It's, it's great that they have a uniform and they're, they're out there and they get to play and, and, and they get to be seen. That's awesome that they're doing it. But there are some things that, you know, that, could, that I think could be changed to, to make it all, you know, we can improve it. Anything could be improved, you know. But I'm just – I think it's really cool on the other end that it's that popular, that a lot of people, you know, still love to play baseball and we have lots of opportunities to go see kids. So there's kind of a catch-22. Todd, you got anything on your front over there? Sure. Um, you know, I think when I think about – I want to echo Rob's point um, about recruiting. The, the analogy I use – I want to echo two points he made about recruiting. Um, the first one is – when, when parents ask me, hey, when should we be making a decision? You know, when, when's the right time? And I always go, you didn't decide when you got married. You decided who you were going to marry. And that, to me, is an example that I use to families all the time, okay? And then the second thing is, you know, one of the biggest mistakes a small business or an entrepreneur can make is they open the doors before they're ready. Before you're ready to sell your product, before the label's right and the marketing's right, and you're in the right location and you're in the right building, you don't open the doors. And I agree with that in terms of, you know, you open the doors when the business is ready to be sold and when the business is ready to be showcased. And it's the same thing for a player. So I just wanted to echo those two statements. I think as far as travel baseball goes, I am certainly um, in favor of it, um, but I am also in favor of the good ones. And, you know, there, there are good and bad high school programs, there's good and bad Legion programs, and there's good and bad travel programs. You know, I particularly enjoy travel baseball simply because of the timing of it. You know, for me, it's if you want to, you know, you want to go look at Iowa who plays the high school season in the summer, I, I would probably prefer high school baseball or Legion baseball. But for me, it's the timing. As our assistant coaches and, and, and me, we don't like to miss practice. You know, we don't like to miss games. That's, that's not something we do. I come from a business background that you take care of a current customer before you take care of a prospective customer. 
And that is something that we believe in. So we just don't miss a lot. You know, we watch a lot of games on Monday and our off days. And so for me, the travel baseball, it is, you know, it is good when it is done well. We are very fortunate that we're, you know, two and a half hours from Atlanta. And, you know, I could tell you that there's 10 to 12 organizations in Atlanta that I think are fantastic. I think they develop. I think they coach. I think the kids have a place to go after school. I think, you know, it gives them, it gives them an opportunity to go work out in the middle of the day. Um, but I think any advice to families is, you know, I am in favor of travel ball to Larry's point. Like, this is great, man. You want all these guys playing and you want these guys doing it. You know, that's fantastic. And, and it does cost money. It does. I mean, you got to turn the lights on and you got to pay the coaches. I mean, it's, you know, it is what it is. And at the same time, there's good ones and there's bad ones. And, you know, I just speak to the Atlanta area because that's where the most popular in South Carolina, you know, we're in the upstate, you know, next to Georgia, I can tell you there's, there's dozens of them that are fantastic that I think do a, a great job. And I would just encourage you to say, you know, same thing, you know, you're just recruit, you know, you're going around, you're looking, but as a family, you're holding the hammer now because you're writing a check and, you know, you get to decide where you go. So, you know, you certainly have that, you know, certainly have that advantage. Scott, anything? Yeah, uh, I would, on, oh, oh, go ahead, Reggie. Go, go ahead. ahead, Kyle. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, to, to Ty's point, um, I, not uh, I, I am in my mid-30s, but the game has changed so much uh, from when we come up. Um, there was park ball. We pay $160 uh, to play. Um, you get a uniform, <laughs> um, and you were drafted off to a team. It was that simple back in the day. And uh, now that travel ball is here, a lot to Todd's point, be sure um, that families out here need to be sure that they're investing in the correct um, travel ball program because development is very important. Um, a lot of travel ball teams, they play a ton of games and kids ask me all the time, hey, how should I approach my travel ball uh, choosings? And I'm saying, hey, look at the coaches that develop you because these are pivotal times to where you have to tweak and then go and test it through the games. And a lot of travel ball programs that we see, they're playing six, eight, six to eight games a week with no development. And like you're saying, you're, they're, yeah, they're, they're being exposed, but it's sloppy. Um, fundamentals are not prepared. Uh, so these are things that are getting kids X'd out. So, like Ty, a lot like Ty said, just really choose carefully um, with your travel league programs. Be sure that you're involved in ones that are developing as well as getting you games in uh, live games. And also another point uh, back to Larry, um, understand uh, just from a recruiting standpoint when it goes back, understand that for smaller schools, a lot of schools you have to sacrifice and uh, travel down and, and get on the campuses and uh, take part in their prospect uh, show prospect camps because not all coaches are going to be able to just get out because we're a lot like Todd. We love to be in-house and take care of our guys. And, um, you know, just hitting the road sometimes is, is difficult, um, you know, as, as far as how many assistants you may have. Um, it just varies from program to program. So sacrifice is a, a, um, something I like to throw out to a lot of kids. Sometimes you have to sacrifice for that opportunity to return itself. Uh, so don't be afraid to get on the road, invest in um, going to get on these college campuses and actually speaking with these coaches and seeing their programs. Um, we tend to respond a little bit differently when our kids are on our campus. Uh, so I think that's a bright spot uh, for the kid and his family to be able to travel down to different campuses to tour the campus and get a feel for the program. Kyle, you hear me? Yep, you're good, Scott. Okay, all right, I had to change out my earbuds. Um, but yeah, I, th I think there's a lot of, um, I think uh, <clears throat> one thing I talked to all of my parents, my travel ball parents this summer about was you got you got to find a balance and what that balance for each and every family could be different 
Um, it could be a, I have three kids. So we have to, we have two girls that play soccer and one that plays baseball. And even though I've been coaching for 19 years, I don't, I don't even know what that balance is on how much my son should play or not play. And, um, and I think as college coaches, high school coaches, and even travel ball coaches, the number one thing that we can do for kids, you know, at eight or nine or 10, you know, you might be a little bit more hesitant. But as they start getting into that Dixie League or the little bit farther bases than Little League, we've got to start being more honest with the players. And I think a lot of times through this baseball pro process, they're sold a, a box of false goods. And, and where they're, they're promoted as uh, this elite player, but they're really not elite. So, so they get through the recruiting process and they think it's one thing. And then once they're completely finished with it, it's a completely different animal. And, and so I think as they go, and, and I think there's a place for showcases, I think there's a place for travel ball, I think there's a place for high school baseball, I think there's a place for rec league, I think there's a place in baseball for everyone because it is awesome that so many people are playing our game now. But on the flip side to it, you also don't want parents to put all their eggs into a basket, one basket and they go to this Power 5 school. Well, there's great schools at Power 5. There's some great schools at mid-majors. There's great schools at D2, D3, junior college. And when I was a junior college coach, our kids would come in and say, I want to be a, D, a D1 player. That's my only goal, coach. And then when I got in Division II baseball, there are some phenomenal coaches and programs in Division II. There's phenomenal programs in NAI, junior college. And so what I would recommend to the parents is they keep an open mind about this and they map out a plan of what's going to work for their family, financially, emotionally. You know, are we going to sacrifice family time to travel around and, and watch baseball all the time? So sitting down as a family and planning out that process, and that's what we're doing with my son. I know he's nine years old. He just turned nine. But in January, me and my wife are going to sit down and plan out my season. We're going to plan out Brandon's season because he's going to have to play a little travel ball because rec league, it is good for the recreation, the community, but there's also kids on there that aren't his caliber, so he's going to have to go play some tournaments. We got to balance out my two daughters, who are probably going to play some travel soccer. We got to buy, buy. We got to balance out finances. I've been a coach for 19 years, so I don't have an unlimited bank account. So my biggest advice to whoever's listening on this is get somebody to be honest with you, and then go out and map out a plan that makes the most sense. And then if one year it doesn't work, then make a few minor adjustments there. Well, for me, this is, it, this is really good stuff because, you know, I'm, I'm not a coach. I, I haven't just, I've been offered to it, but it's not something I want to do. I'm more in the player development and more focused on, you know, my background first came in, in strength conditioning. I, I, I had two elbow surgeries in college. Uh, after, you know, I, I told you guys kind of changed the arm slot and got some attention there. Well, that's when things started going downhill for me. And I had to have back-to-back -back elbow surgeries. I was out for three years and I started realizing how I was so focused on the camps, the clinics, the showcases, uh, going and, and working with a pitching coach, a hitting coach, all skill related stuff, because I thought, you know, I just needed, I needed better mechanics. I needed better this. I needed better that when, you know, like you guys were talking about before that I wasn't showcase ready. You know, I, I went to my very first showcase in high school senior year. And when I got done throwing on the mound, I had one of the coaches come up and said, oh, man, I thought you were going to throw harder than that. And I was, oh, that just like that, <laughs> that cut deep, you know. And it wasn't really until college that I started getting after it more on the strength conditioning side of things. And I just, for me, that's, that's where I start with this. And you guys were talking about the, the development for these travel ball teams and and things like that I think parents you really got to look and, and understand that if if a kid is going and playing five plus games in a weekend one that is not what a, a high school schedule is like a college schedule is like or a pro schedule is like you know none of these players are playing like that and two you know I just was having this discussion with uh with one of the kids he's, he's going into freshman year this year so he's he's got a little bit of time and I can be a little more lenient with him on this but his mom is is kind of kind of in your in your scoot, uh, shoe scott is you know she's got three other kids that she's got to deal with and her her one son who's going into freshman year here is it, he's he said he stopped pitching because he was undersized and didn't throw hard enough 
And it's like, I've been trying to get him to come on as a client and work with me to help him, you know, get stronger and get faster and throwing harder. And then I said, well, what are you guys doing instead? Cause you know, she couldn't afford to work with me. It's like, well, we got uh, two practices coming up and then we start tournaments. And I was just like, Oh, okay. That, that's not going to get him doing the work that he needs to do to get, even if he doesn't want to keep pitching, that's fine. That's on him. But that work in the gym, that work on his body, uh, to grow. And obviously, you know, when you're that young, you're still going to be growing and developing physically. So there's only so much you can do there, but I feel like there's, you know, so many players get focused on, on the camps, the clinics, the showcases, the tools and the technique when they're undersized, they're underdeveloped, and they're not taking the time that they're going to go play. They're going to go invest that money in, in, in the, the travel ball team to go play six, eight games in a weekend when their body is physically not, not only not strong enough, not fast enough, but they don't realize that, the endurance piece of it that they, you know, how many teams go in and dominate on, on Saturday and dominate in, into the, um, into the pool play and then championship game comes in, you know, there's, there's teams that drop out that don't want to stay till eight, nine o'clock to play the championship game because they're too tired. It's too late for them to travel back, whatever it is. And they go out and they've got to use like three, four different pitchers because they don't have enough guys. Their starters already through, five innings the day before and they've got an inning cap, whatever it is. So that, you know, I'd like to have you guys, like, where do you draw the line on, on the travel ball side of things? And, and I know some of you guys were talking about the development piece, you know, what is it exactly? What is it? What is a good travel ball team that's developmental focused? What are they doing that is focused on that development? How are they really developing these players and, and what you guys have seen? You know, I want to jump in on that because something you said that'll tie into that question is something that actually happened at Larry's place about five years ago. And I don't know if he remembers it or not, but there was, uh, there was a pitcher I was looking at from around my area who had, I know he had pitched um, over the weekend for his travel ball organization. And on, you know, and he was 79, 82, you know, not great, but, you know, projectable body long and loose and might develop into something. I watched him on Tuesday. He was throwing it at the showcase there. And I mean, every pitch, I mean, he's 74, 76, he's grabbing his arm, he's kind of working it, he's doing this. And I said something to Larry about it, and they got him off the mound. But, it, but that's, that's where kind of this idea of why is this kid paying me not to recruit him anymore? Why is he coming out here and, and blowing 74, 76 when he can throw harder and he's, he's destroying his arm? He didn't pitch that year, his senior year in high school, and he was done. So to me, the travel ball organizations to go to your, um, you know, your question is they, they've got to do a good job of, of keeping tabs on their players and helping them understand what that development piece looks like. And, and like Coach Hollins mentioned earlier, uh, there needs to be development. And then, you know, you can test your stuff out during the games, but not to the detriment of your development. You know, you, you've got to improve through playing and you've got to improve through that development time you can't go backwards and I've seen some players go backwards because they've overdone it they've they've pitched too much and they haven't thrown enough you know so instead of being on a throwing routine they're trying to pitch on a on a Saturday start five innings then Sunday you know they got to come in in relief and then Tuesday they got to showcase and they got to do this again and again and they they pitch too much and they don't throw in between because their arms killing them by the time they get to early July and they're trying to, you know, grind out through the last three weeks. They're going backwards. So to me, those travel ball organizations, um, the good ones do a good job of monitoring their kids' workloads. They, they talk with them honestly about what they need to do to develop, and they give them the tools to develop, as opposed to uh, just grinding them up into dust and then getting the next group of kids in and having the same thing happen, you know, chasing rings and trophies and accolades for their travel organizations. And some do a great job of it. Uh, and, and some, it, it's, it's not as thorough as it needs to be. So to answer your question, to me, I think that's, that's you know, kind of echoing what some of these other coaches have said. There's got to be uh, more emphasis on the development piece, uh, the behind-the-scenes stuff, than maybe what happens when the, you know, when the guys are on stage Saturday and Sunday in these tournaments and showcase. And, Kyle, I want to jump in. You asked the question about what would you like to see in the development. A developed player – if, if they're going to spend all kinds of money and all kinds of time and all kinds of energy into baseball, that player needs to be able to come into my program 
and understand what his skill set is, what adjustment he has to make. It even goes as far as a developed player needs to know what the nutritional aspect of it is to take to play a doubleheader in college. What should they be eating the night before? What should they eat the next morning? How many bottles of water should they drink to be hydrated compared to how many Gatorades? What adjustments they're going to make pitch to pitch? If you've spent $2,000 on hitting instruction, you should be able to make your own adjustments by the time you get to my place. I might be able to tweak you a little bit, but, but if you can't sit here and repeat a lot of the stuff that you need to be doing about your swing, I'm going through it with my nephew right now, about, you know, what are you trying to do? What are your adjustments? What, what is your philosophy? You know, how to catch a ground ball. You, if you've spent all this money, you should have spent some of that money on a strength and conditioning coach to teach you how to work out. What is your body type? What kind of player are you? Are you a fast player where you need to train fast? Are you a big, strong player? You need to, you need to train to, to hit the ball at the ballpark. And Charlie Blackman came and talked to us one time when we were at junior college because he had a cousin that coached with me. And he says, you train to the what type of player you are, and everybody should be training different. So that developed player needs to know all aspects of what it takes to be a college baseball player. And if they're not getting that, then they are not doing themselves justice financially and, and career-wise because at some point there's going to be somebody that comes into our program that does have all those variables, and they're going to go right past them. So the developed player is not just on the field. It's in the nutrition. It's in how much sleep I need. You know, all of those things, and I talk about a daily journal and, hey, when I feel good, let's write down when I feel good. What did I eat that morning? What did I eat last night? How many hours of sleep did I get? How many bottles of water? And it's to that exact science, to the teams that are always at the top. And if you go into any program, you can take any, any power five football program that, that, that wins all the time. Yes, they've got the best players, but they've also got all the best – uh, avenues and resources for their players to be successful. And you can do all that uh, on a low budget because we, we have a very low budget. But it's providing snacks in between games so they're fueled properly, a drag, uh, you know, a drag point. And everybody says, we well, got to have some kind of Gatorade chew. Well, we can't afford Gatorade chew. So I heard a nutritionist talk said a pile of gummy bears is what you need in the seventh inning to get that sugar spike to get you going. So a developed player is a developed player from top to bottom, ins and outs, and knows what type of player they are. They can tell that coach, this is what – these are my mistakes and how do I fix them? And that college coach is just there to guide them to get them better. And if they do that, then I think they got their money's worth. Yeah, I would, I would definitely say um, uh, just – in, internally um, developing a kid's mental game uh, for me uh, stands his ground. I think the mental game is not focused on enough, um, you know, year round, definitely, um, just depending on what travel unit you're with or what high school. Uh, I, I would say definitely do, um, mental game is, is a big piece, you know, encouraging a lot of the coaches to have more classroom sessions uh, just to challenge their kids mentally just to understand situations um, and different things that could occur uh, during the game. Another thing is uh, for our guys, we definitely um, talk about wasted work days um, because a lot of kids um, these days, are, a lot of kids that walk on to my program uh, that have walked on in the program in the past, uh, we would talk about, um, you know, how hard they're working, but, the efficiency of their hard work. Uh, so just, just making sure um, that their work that they're putting out is efficient. Um, is it actually getting you better? Um, last thing, weight room. That was a, that's another big thing that stands out for me uh, for the younger guys looking to transition into college. Um, properly, um, you know, learning fundamentals in the weight room on how to get, uh, you know, their strengthening corrected. And also, um, how to properly train your body so it can withstand. Uh, I heard a lot of coaches just talking about having your body in shape for uh, double headers, uh, three, three, three games in a weekend. Um, just teaching the kids how to just be ready from a total development uh, standpoint to transition to college. Um, that's, that's just really what stands out to me. The mental game, 
um, efficient work and uh, that weight room. Um, that, that stands out. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the middle game piece, you know, not something we had a chance to get into with all the kind of tactical stuff and, and the recruiting side of things. But obviously that that's huge. You know, the Yogi Berra quote, uh, you know, b baseball is 90 percent mental and the other half's physical. I mean, it's it's something you kind of laugh at and all, all, all us coaches know is important and and players, you know, realize is important, but they don't, you know, if it if it's really 90 percent of the game but you're spending less than 10% of the time on it. Are you really focused and, and developing, you know, the middle game? And obviously that's a, an, another topic for another day and another, another call, but, you know, a couple of great resources are, you know, heads up baseball. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, the middle, the middle game by uh, Harvey Dorfman, as well as uh, the middle game of baseball, excuse me, that's what it was, is, is another great resource out there. I think it's, you know, for me, I, my my message to, to players and, and to parents is it is the responsibility of you as a player to learn how your body works, to learn how your mind works. And you're the one who's going to be putting the food in your body. You're the one that's going to be hydrating yourself. You're the one that's holding yourself accountable of when you got to go to bed at night, when you got to wake up, what time you're going to show up to the weight room, what time you're going to show up to practice, all these things. And it's not, you know, especially when you get into college, coaches are going to be like, all right, practice starts at this time, bus leaves at this time. And if you're not there and you're not doing the work, you know, you're only shooting yourself in the foot. So it's on players to take the responsibility to, to learn what it means to get stronger in the gym. What do they need to do physically? What do they need to do mentally? What do, I'm glad you brought it up, uh, Scott, about, you know, the nutrition piece, because that's, that's something I harp on with all my guys. And it's, it's easily, especially in college, overlooked. So, um, you know, that's, that's my two cents on the matter. You know, I think if I was going to, you know, offer up any any advice for parents, recruits looking at this, it, it's got to be the parents who have to get educated also because they're the ones who are writing the checks. And, you know, they, they need to ask the questions because every travel organization is going to highlight the players they've, they've sent to the next level. You know, this player played here for this travel ball organization and now look where he is. And, and he may have only spent a half a summer there. He only played a, a few tournaments or played one summer there. Um, it's, you know, it's something where I think you have to get under the surface and you have to talk to the coach or, or get a feel from somebody who's played in the organization before. How much do they do, you know, like, like some of the other coaches have said, away from the field? How much do they do with this development piece? What am I investing my money in? I think there's too many people uh, who throw their money away and they throw good money after bad money, um, you know, chasing down a travel ball organization based on its reputation versus what it really is. Um, and, and I think the showcases, that's another one also. Some of them are, are money grabs that don't, you know, do any benefit for the players and others are, are good and give them good feedback. And I think that's where parents need to do their, um, their research, you know, get on, get on the organization's websites, you know, track down the background of the coaches, reach out to the coaches and ask about their philosophy. You know, what is, what is your organization all about? What do you guys stand for? And, and what do you want to see uh, for my son? If we're going to spend fifteen hundred dollars two thousand dollars and and have to you know stay at these hotels and, and do these things that are mandated at these tournaments if i'm gonna have to spend this money um parents need to get back in control of it sometimes and and do that research and find out who's who's doing that development um you know holistically versus just playing games well, any other uh you know closing thoughts from you guys I know I appreciate your time tonight and want to respect that um, anybody who's got uh, anything subjects we didn't cover just any kind of points that you guys want to highlight somebody else brought up uh, as we as we wrap up tonight hey Cal, can I ask a question hey Troy what you got you guys talked earlier about uh, not being able to get out much and having some guys on Zoom calls and different things like what we're doing now. Um, so you also talked about the player being, you know, aggressively recruiting the school, basically. Um, so, so does the player need to be requesting those things to you guys? Um, and also, if you guys can't get out, 
are you able to have small groups on campus? If, if I brought a small group to work out for you, say Larry, I mean, is, is that a doable thing? Is that something you guys are interested in? If we could, we would, but with all the COVID stuff, hell, they don't want to, you know, we don't, nobody's allowed on camp. I mean, aside from visits through admissions, I mean, I can't have anybody on the field or I can't, I, we can't even, can't even see you in person. We can't see the kids in person when they're on campus. So, um, so I mean, I, we, we couldn't do that. Yeah. I, I, I think, I think we're doing as best we can right now. I also think that, you know, the, there, there are certainly people out there, kids out there that maybe we haven't seen that could play for us. And there's only one, I mean, you know, either it's coaches reach out to us or players reach out to us. But, you know, I think generally speaking, it, the schools that are recruiting you is, you know, a pretty good indication at what level that that kid can probably play. And that's the, that's the avenue that the kid needs to probably pursue. He doesn't need to pursue UCLA, you know, if he's, if he's not getting any attention from power five schools, you know, he, he needs to, you know, do that. But I don't know, it's, it's tough. It's, you know, as far as having anybody on campus, we couldn't do it. If you could bring a group, I'd love for you to, but we can't right now. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's just an odd time, man. It's a really it is. It is. odd, odd time, you know, for you – know, have, you have four or five seniors you want to change – you want to give, a, give them – or help give them an opportunity or help open up doors for them, and you're banging on doors and nobody's answering and nobody's – you know, it's like, I don't, I don't want to tell you. It's – you just got to keep banging. You got to keep knocking. You got to keep sending yeah. – you know, I, I think I think the kids and the parents should take a lot of this on themselves. I don't like what do, what do the showcases do for you? You know, aside from a parent probably not having a radar gun, they could probably go get one of those little pocket radars. That might work. They have a stopwatch. They can measure sixty yards. They can measure ninety feet. They can do you can do they can do things and video things and save themselves money and and get it out to you know create their own video and get it out to schools. Uh, you know, that'd be something. I, I always appreciate that when the kid you know, does it, you know, when they do it themselves or take it upon themselves to gather game video and put it together. But All right. that's a, it's a, it's a really tough spot that the, that this class is in, you know, and Troy, I'll, I'll follow up on that too, is that, you know, the core group of recruits that I have in this 2021 class are generally players who have been recruiting themselves aggressively to my program. People who've reached out, I've had a, Parent reach out, send me some great video of his son, you know, a pitcher, and I got a chance to to look at him and, and had conversations with him. Um, you know, same thing with, uh, you know, a couple other uh, outfielder, infielders, you know, different position guys have reached out and, and aggressively reached out to us. And, and that, to me, I think says a lot, one, about the person's character, uh, but then there's there's that as far as, okay, I know this person is really legitimately interested and he's not just sending out a blanket email that I'm getting from uh, recruiting services, sending this same thing out to, to 2,000 other schools around the country. So I think, uh, you know, your advice in your position would be to, to have the players really look and say, okay, what are the, the six, eight, 10, 12 schools that I'm really interested in? I'm going to really target and, and personally email them, send them my video, and, and let them really do an, a thorough evaluation on me that way and, and hopefully start to develop the relationship um, because we just we can't go out and initiate it the way we've been able to in the past. So I think you got to tell the kids and the parents you got to get out and, and be a little bit more uh, aggressive, for lack of a better term for it, and, and reach out and, and get answers from the coaches rather than sitting back and waiting. And I, and I, one other thing I piggyback on a little bit, it, it, it's something that it's kind of a, a pet peeve, I guess, when uh, a recruiting service or someone, so it's like it's the kid's agent, like he's trying to sell a kid, or it could be a coach, a summer ball coach, a high school coach, any, anybody, you know, and have, this kid can, he can come, he can play for you. He could be a really good player for you. He could do this. Have you seen us play? No. Well, then how the hell do you know he can? You don't know he can. You're just, you're just selling me because he's the best player. I mean, I think, the players and the coaches or the person person or persons that are doing the salesman job or the or playing the role of the agent, they need to 
I mean, I, I think it'd be appreciated if they would – I would expect it. I would hate to – I would never tell somebody if he can play. Hell, I have never seen you play. How the hell do I know if he can play for you or not? I'd like the, the, the coach or somebody to, I mean, have a better idea if you can, especially if you're in a, a – especially if you work for a recruiting service or if you're in a position where you've, you're, you're, you're coaching at a, with a summer program or a high school program. You know, hopefully you've, you've got a pretty good idea of uh, – you've at least seen the, seen the club that you're trying to, you know, sell the kid to or, you know, promote the kid to. Um, I don't know. That's just kind of a, I guess, soapbox thing. But it's kind of – it's frustrating. I think, it, I think it's probably more so at smaller schools. Like I know when we – you know, when I first got to Bellarmine, it's a small school in Louisville, Kentucky. It's a Division two school. And I, just, I mean, oh, he can come play for you. Well, how the hell do you know? Have you seen us play? Nope. Well, I mean, we're, it's a little different, you know? And, and so I think that's something that I think a lot of parents, players, and coaches could, you know, don't just assume just because he's not getting any power five or division one attention that he can just go play. Oh, well, then he can just go do this. Well, I don't know. It's there's pretty good baseball everywhere, you know, at all levels. So I think, I think if they could, you know, really, you know, Everybody needs to do their homework. We're doing it, and so, you know, I, I think we appreciate it too, and I, I think it speaks volumes when, when the, the coaches and the players do their homework as well. So, I don't know, kind of off tangent maybe, but I, I think it's things people need to hear. Um, and then one thing I want to add too, again, sorry. I just got to thinking about the player development piece and – there's, there's different types of player development to me, the way I think of it, and maybe I'm different, or maybe I'm just a, I don't know, a different way to think about it. But, you know, you have the strength condition in peace, you have the skill development, but, you know, and then and Reggie touched on the, the mental aspect. And so I think of the mental aspect differently too. I mean, can you handle failure? Can you handle, can you mentally handle this? But then like the, the player of the – Summer ball or, or summer ball or so-called travel ball, they want to emulate baseball at the highest levels, but they, their schedule doesn't come close to emulating it. In the minor leagues, we played 140 games. We practiced a good 100 times before, uh, before games. 100 times before a game, we'd practice. And they play three or f- play five games on a weekend, typically, and not all, but some good organizations will practice a couple times during the week, but that's really difficult, too. It's not – it's, it's the, it just depends. I mean, if you're a travel organization and all your kids come from two or three hours away, how the hell are they going to practice? And then, or if you're a 10, 12 year old team, how are you going to ask a 10, 12 year old to come to practice two or three times a week and play the schedule that you want to play? So you're, you're trying to emulate and, and develop a kid when, you know, player development is us creating an environment. To me, a big piece of player development is us creating an environment for them to go play the game and learn how to play the game and make decisions during the game so that I'm not watching a summer ball game and the right fielder is 20 feet from the foul line and the left fielder is 20 feet from the foul line and nobody says a damn word to anybody. Or we show up and there's men on first and second and the first baseman's holding the guy at first. What are y'all doing? I mean, you know, watch some baseball. Watch, watch it. Learn. If you don't know, reach out to Rob. Reach out to Troy. Reach out to Scott or Todd or Reggie. And people would love to help you. You know, help you learn how to – teach the game and learn how to help develop the kids so that, you know, it's just, again, it gets you, it's, it's like just as, just as important as Scott Mitch talked about nutrition and being able to navigate through a double header on a weekend. I mean, hell, I'd like you to know that you need to cover first base when you hit the ball, the first baseman, you know, if you're a pitcher, I'd like you to have an idea of, you know, how to play the game, you know? Uh, and so I think that's something that we meant, but it's, you know, and like the weekend schedule, if they play, a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I've been to many, many, many travel ball tournaments where they, as soon as you get to the field, they go straight to the cage and hit. And they hit Friday, and they hit Saturday, and they hit Sunday. Well, you could have worked on one simple bunk coverage on Friday, gone to the cage Saturday. On Sunday, you go to the parking lot and work on rundowns. I mean, you could knock out. That's player development. That's teaching them how to play the game. Uh, and you could you have five weekends. You, you map out your weekends. Now, the next weekend, we're going to hit twice and do one team fundamental. You know, and all the while, we'll pick times if, we, if, if we're lucky enough to have kids from uh, pretty close proximity, we can get them in the weight room and we can teach them about nutrition and we can teach them about taking care of their body and we can teach them about their swing and I can use the Rapsodo and all this stuff that I have to help them develop skills 
but they still have to know how to use those skills, you know, on the field. So there's, it's all encompassing and, you know, it's, it's great that we have it. There's just, I just, I wish, I wish we could, like, if my, if I had my wish, I wish some of the summer programs would take player development from a team fundamental standpoint and do more team fundamentals on the weekend if they had a chance. Or how about maybe the first game of the day at a current tournament? I know it's asking a lot, but let them take infield. I may be there to see the fourth outfielder and he's not playing that day and I can't watch the game because I got to go over across town and watch Johnny Smith pitch and I could at least watch him throw. I could watch him do something, but I can't because you guys don't take a round of infield before the game. I understand the time constraints. I understand. But if that's the true goal, if that's the true goal of helping these kids find a place to play and developing them, then damn, we got to find the time to do it. Cause we don't find the time to do it. We want your money. we got to get your two games. There's a minimum rains coming. I don't give a damn. I got our money. I don't have to give you a refund. See you. Bye. And that's how they do it. And and it's not, it's not the team sometimes. A lot of it's the tournament, the tournament directors. Hell, they're making money too. They're making money. The teams are making money. Well, let's do what we say we're going to do and let's develop the kids the right way and, and give them opportunities to develop and give them opportunities to be little, little bitty small adjustments, I think could go a long way in all this. And I don't know, that's just, I, I've written a couple articles about it. It's a big, big, big deal for me. Just, seeing and how, seeing how it's evolved over the past 25, 30 years. And it is, you know, there's, there's, to me, to me, to me, I think of one guy, I remember one guy, we flew in, it was in rookie ball. He flew, he flew to the, he flew to the ballpark in gym shorts and the school t-shirt, you know, and he's going to pro ball. I'm like, what are you doing? You know, that's part of player development, teaching a guy how to dress, coming to the ballpark and leaving the ballpark. That, that was part of it. And so player development is like all encompassing. And I don't know. It's like you, I said, you mean, a, you're not a big fan of kids going to the cage and hitting in slides or Crocs? No, absolutely not. And I mean, there's a lot of people that feel the same way, but then a lot of cases you can't, I mean, what are you going to do? You know, you, uh, I guess, I don't know. It's a, it's important, man. This is important. We could, it's great that we have all the kids playing and, and it's awesome. There's some great, great organizations out there. There's some great ones here in Louisville. I love some things guys do here in Louisville in particular, but dang, there's some bad ones too, man. And, you know, I just, just got to, we want to try and get it right, man. We want to try and help kids. If that's the true goal, help the kids land someplace and develop them and let's do what we can playing, running them out there, having a roster full of 12 guys and playing, six games in three days and you know I've asked I've asked kids we're recruiting now how many times have you pitched back-to-back -back innings how many times have you pitched multiple innings back-to-back -back days in the summer and he goes oh shit since I was 10 12 years old I do it every weekend that's like I get fired for that I, you know you can't do those things to kids so I don't know pretty passionate about it but I was going to try and stay away from it but I couldn't help it Well, it's good you brought that up that I really like the, the strategic piece of it of, you know, the what they can do on, on a Friday, on a Saturday, on a Sunday, just to get them those extra player development reps, you know, and, and scheduling that out. Because I think one of the biggest things people don't realize, especially coaches, you know, you're dealing with a lot of dad coaches and in, in the travel ball stuff and, and through rec ball is they're they're just showing and going all the time, but they don't realize that time is very precise. You're going to show, you're going to have games that, at, that are going to start at the exact same time. You know, when your schedule is going to be, you know, pretty much, I mean, granted, you, you don't, you don't necessarily know when it comes to the pool play, but you know, you're going to play Saturday, Sun, Monday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and you're going to have that time to, okay, let me just, you know, what does our team need instead of just bitching and moaning at the players after the game, because they don't know how to do rundowns or they don't know how to do PFPs or, you know, feel, the, the first and thirds, all that stuff, take the time in between games, take the time. Uh, like you said, I, I, I love that. That was very strategic. So I, I like that. I feel like that's going to help a, a lot of people out that, you know, I, I've been umpiring. I've been doing the player development, I kind of basically every role, but head coaching. And that's not something I see at any of these tournaments and being down in Dallas. I mean, that's, that's all it is, is just travel and select baseball, you know, and growing up, it was, it was all American Legion ball at the high school level for me. And I, I looked the other day, I think Connecticut or somewhere, you know, up in, in the Northeast has more 
in, in that state, one of those tiny states has more American Legion teams than Texas and Oklahoma combined. You know, they have like maybe 10 between the two states, but they've got thousands of, of select and, and travel ball teams. It's, it, it's out of control. Yeah, you know, one thing I'll say to that on, on Larry's point there too, and then kind of what you're talking about is, you know, for these travel ball teams, if they want to do some of that, they don't have to have a full field. They can take from, uh, you know, basketball and football. They can do simple walkthroughs, just a small space. You want to walk through a bunt coverage, take a 40 by 40, 50 by 50 space, and just walk through, hey, third baseman goes here, first baseman goes here. and You know, just um, – he doesn't have to be full distance, but just something to get them thinking, just – Something to, you know, get that development piece going where they're understanding the game a little bit more than just going to the cage and hitting and, you know, throwing and, and stretching a little bit and playing. Uh, to me, I think that's where a, a summer ball coach or a rec ball coach, even if you don't have access to a full field, you can get some development that way just by doing some simple walkthrough stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, there was uh, somebody on Twitter, Next Level Baseball, the other day I saw him tweet and I was like what was the weirdest pregame uh ritual you've seen or pregame you know warm-up strategy whatever and he was like oh these guys uh were taking infield beep infield uh not bp but they were taking pregame infield without you know the coach hitting the ball to him but he was swinging you know dry swings to him I was like well if you look at the science behind it and you look at some what other sports are doing it's not that crazy uh but I mean maybe sure I, I get that as a pregame strategy you know, hey, the guys want to get the reps and, and get that work in, live, live feels. But there's, a you know, like exactly what you're saying, there's a lot of power in, in those dry reps, getting the visualization piece of it. And then just, you know, breaking down on a whiteboard, just sitting down and, and drawing the plays out this way and that way. You know, they, they can get a, a lot out of it that way as well. Well, I know as we're kind of wrapping up here, if anybody else has anything, uh, I want to get, you know, we've got a few coaches still here sticking with us. If you guys have any other questions, uh, drop it into the chat and we'll make sure to get that answered. But um, Reggie, Scott, Todd, you guys got anything else before uh, we wrap it up here tonight? I don't. No, I don't. Everything was great. Appreciate everybody spending time to, uh, you know, say their opinion on stuff. I thought it was a great session. Yeah, I just want to say thanks for having me on. I feel like, you know, we're the ones that are, you know, supposed to be supposed to be giving advice, but, you know, just hearing different perspectives. I know, you know, I'll take a lot of things I've heard with me, you know, moving forward from other programs. So thank you very much for everybody sharing and being so honest and upfront. I thought the, I thought the transparency of this call was really good. Hey, before we get off here, and I hate to interrupt you, Reggie, but I had a question privately from, uh, from a coach about, uh, rosters and information in summer ball. And, and what I would say, and I, I really am remiss in not mentioning this, but uh, coaches, make sure you've got rosters, you know, and fill out as much information as you can. Contact information, grades, who's going to pitch on what days. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've gone and, you know, go ask a coach to the dugout, hey, do you have your roster? Oh, no, sorry, but I'll, I'll write something or my assistant coach will write something out for you real quick. And I, I get names and numbers, and that's it. And there's no information there. So coaches, you guys can do us uh, such a, a huge service by having rosters ready with plenty of that information. Where do they go to school? What are their grades like? ACT score, uh, stuff like that. That's absolutely huge for us to have that. So yeah, I've had some of those emailed to me in advance. And it's just, it's great. I can print that thing off. I can go and I can sit and, and know exactly who I'm watching and, and get uh, a real good glimpse into, into who I'm watching and what you know what they could possibly do for us from a recruiting standpoint, if I can even recruit them because of their grades or, or you know what have you. Yeah, thank, thanks for the invite. Um, enjoyed everyone's uh, dialogue uh, just around baseball topics. It's always good to talk about the game uh, and, and pick the brains of. Uh, success, successful coaches. Uh, so just thank you again and uh, wishing everyone the best through this trying time and uh, stay, stay safe out there. Yep. Thanks. Thanks all you coaches for coming on. I know this is a real busy and hectic time for you guys just getting the school year ramped up and trying to get figured out 
uh, what's going on with your programs and your teams and everything else. So uh, you guys coming on and, and sharing and being so open tonight, which is huge. You know, I, I really appreciate that. And we've got uh, some good feedback coming here in the chat from everybody. So um, thank you guys again for that. Uh, I will, I have this recorded. So I'll, I have a Facebook group, free, a free Facebook group for anybody who wants to join. It's called Baseball Player Development. Uh, I, I drop a lot of daily tips in there on, on all these different topics that we're covering, uh, sharing some videos like this. And we've got some like Rob's that he did with the Virtual Baseball Coaches Summit we did a few months back. Got some of those replays and, and different things in there. So um, go in there and, and check that out as well. Um, coaches, I'd love to connect with you guys. I, I found this guy in a, in a Facebook group. Uh, a while back and he's out in the Dominican in the DR and he's, you know, 21 years old, uh, right-handed pitcher looking to come to the States and, and get a college scholarship. I know we talked a lot about how crazy it is and some of this stuff, but if uh, that's definitely one subject we didn't quite get to cover was the international side of things. And I know there's a lot of great, great talent over there that's looking to come into the States, but if any of you guys are looking uh, for a guy just randomly found him and he's looking for some, uh, you know, looking for a place to go and up mid, mid upper eighties seems like a good kid, a uh, hard worker. So I don't know too much about him, but thought I'd just throw that out there. If anybody's looking for a, a good arm. So thanks again, everybody. And like I said, baseball player development is the name of the Facebook group. You can check it out. I'll have the replay up in there. And then eventually once we get everything downloaded, we'll put this up on YouTube as well. You guys can uh, check it out on there. So um, thanks Reggie. Thanks Larry. Thanks Scott. Thanks, Rob, and uh, thank you all for coming on tonight, and we will see you uh, on the next one, hopefully. Take care. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, everybody else. Thanks, Appreciate Todd. It. Thanks, guys.